Well, I want to thank those of you that are participating in the FAQs here at the uh, the Church of the Ascension YouTube channel. Um, you know, it, it lets us know that people are watching and they're paying attention. And in the recent uh, time, we've received a couple questions to some of the videos, and I want to take an opportunity to begin answering some of those. One of the questions that we got uh, was a request to explain when it comes to the hierarchy, how the Anglican church is organized. So how is the church, let's let's start there, say the church organized, okay? So if you've got a Bible, um, or if it's in front of you, you can look these up or you can just jot these down. In the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, many times he mentions the word church, but there are five times, five times in this chapter where Paul mentions the churches or no... Uh, he says, we have no other practice in the churches of God or in all the churches. He uses a phrase similar to that. Add to those five times, he mentions the church in Corinth in chapter 1. And in chapter 16, he mentions the church or the churches in Galatia. He mentions the churches in Asia. And he mentions a specific church that meets in the house of Aquila and Priscilla. What does this tell us? And why is Paul talking about all the churches so many times to the Corinthians? Well, we see a couple things. One, the church is organized by geography. So in any geographic place, you will talk about the church of X, Asia, Corinth, Galatia, uh, Jerusalem, Judea. It's, it's reference to geography. So when we say Anglican church, we would biblically be saying the church as she has been known in England, or in the, the United Kingdom, specifically that collection of islands, and, and, and notably Anglo-Saxon connections, right? That, that's part of what's going on there. But the Anglican communion has become global. But even as it's a communion, the third largest historic global communion right now, um, it's very diverse. So when we say global, you could say the church in Nigeria, Right, So there's, there's variation here, but there's something really important about this, all the churches, and then understanding the churches in particular places. And when we talk about bishops, what we're talking about with the bishops are those uh, men that have been ordained. Uh, let's talk about the first bishops. Those men who were ordained or specifically appointed and specifically appointed by the apostles. Now to do this, we've got to step out of um, or step back and look upon the, the, the New Testament era, the development of it in the first century and the, the writings that we have. And we see that Jesus breathes on the apostles in John chapter 20. He breathes on them and says, Receive the Holy Spirit. As the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. He says, Whoever sins you forgive, they're forgiven. Whoever sins you retain, they're retained. He gives this power to the apostles. Okay? Well, we see them going out and preaching the gospel. We see them baptizing and ministering the sacrament of the Eucharist uh, and, and, and granting people absolution of sin to be in or out of fellowship. Paul does this in 1 Corinthians 5. He restores that person in 2 Corinthians 2. James, uh, or I'm, I'm sorry, P Peter does the same thing in Acts chapter 8. John talks about it in his letters as well, this, this idea of their fellowship with the church. And that is this power Jesus talks about. Here's something that we see them doing as well. The apostles, as time moves forward, and they haven't been martyred yet, but getting closer towards their martyrdom, not only are they appointing elders or priests in every place, and we'll, we'll touch about on that in a little bit and in another video. Um, not only are they appointing elders in every place, and we see that they do this, Timothy's told to do this in Ephesus by Paul. He tells Titus to do this in Crete in Titus 1. And we see that he and Barnabas are doing this on their apostolic journeys in Acts chapter 13 and other places in the book of Acts. Not only are they appointing elders, not only are they appointing deacons. Again, we see this in the book of Acts and in Paul's letters that this is what the apostles are doing. Now they start to do something a little bit more different. Now they're appointing people to represent them overseeing the churches in a, in a given place. So we see that Timothy becomes the bishop. And I'm gonna, uh, it's going to sound a little anachronistic for a second, but it just, it's to help us to understand. Timothy becomes the apostolic appointee in Ephesus, the bishop. 
Titus, the Bishop of Crete. Uh, then we have Mark, and this now we're moving into Christian history that's confirmed and verified by Christian um, traditions. Mark in Alexandria, Ignatius in Antioch, and Clement in Rome. Well, Polycarp in Smyrna, and many others that we have in, in the pages of Christian history, some of whom, as I mentioned, like Clement, they think may be mentioned in the New Testament itself, but we know that the apostles appointed them or someone immediately uh, close in time, proximity to the apostles. So the bishops are these apostolic successors in a very direct sense. Now, the apostolic succession, let me set my Bible down. The apostolic succession of the apostles doesn't just go one to one. It, it breaks out like a net. So when you look at one of the earliest writings we have in Christian history, the apostolic tradition by a guy named Hippolytus who was living in Rome, he was observing some innovations that were taking place, and he said, no, no, let's keep with the, the apostolic tradition as we've received it. He says there needs to be three bishops to make a priest a bishop. And there are specific prayers, specifically requesting in prayer that God would pour out his Holy Spirit to make that uh, the person becoming this man becoming a bishop, uh, that he would have grace to cast out demons, to pray for the sick, that he would have grace to teach and defend the faith. He's a, a chief pastor in the church. So not the apostolic succession and bishops aren't just a, like a line of dominoes. They're like a line of dominoes that are a net around the world. And they're preserving as a, as a college of bishops, as you will, as, a, as a people sharing in this apostolic ministry, um, what we see Paul talking to the Corinthians about. That it's the job, it's the role, it's the responsibility, and because it's the responsibility, there's the corresponding authority in the office of the bishop, and all of them together, and then diversely, individually, in their various uh, geographic places, for the bishops to defend and to preserve the gospel as it was given to the apostles, and then by the apostles given to them. Paul mentions that five times in 1 Corinthians. It's not something we can take lightly. He says it to Timothy this way, guard what has been entrusted to you, O Timothy. He says in one place to guard the gospel by the Holy Spirit that's in him and to guard by the laying on, because he's received the laying on of hands. So we've got this, uh, not just, a, like I said, a, a domino effect, but a whole net. And the bishops are the chief pastors. The bishops are those in historic, tactile, manual succession to the laying on of hands whose responsibility is to preserve and to guard and to preach and to teach the gospel, even if it costs them their lives. When it comes to their specific roles within the church, they're the chief pastor. They function sort of like the high priest with the priests and the Levites in ancient Israel. We see this spelled out for us in Christian tradition as well, that the, uh, the fathers of the church explain these Old Testament passages being fulfilled in the church this way. Bishops um, had been priests and they had been deacons. So because of that, they can do everything deacons do and they do everything priests do. But as bishops, they have a couple extra responsibilities and powers, if you will, one of which is to confirm. We see Peter and John doing this in Acts chapter 8. We see Paul referring to this in Romans chapter 1, where they come by and they lay their hands to confirm, to, to validate, to affirm. And in the process of laying their hands to confirm and affirm the believer who's been baptized, they're praying for a strengthening and a quickening of the Holy Spirit in the life of that believer. Okay. Another thing that bishops have the power and responsibility for is to ordain. Deacons and priests can't do that. Only the bishops can ordain. And the bishops ordain someone to be a, uh, a deacon. And then the bishops ordain, the, and it's only the bishop who makes the person a deacon. And then the bishop in concert with other priests, he doesn't need them, but with other priests, the bishop makes the deacon a priest. And then if they, a priest is being moved upon by the Holy Spirit at the discernment of the church to become a bishop, a bishop and two others, at least three other bishops. Hippolytus tells us that that was the practice that he got, they, got, they had received from the apostles. And we see that in the New Testament. So even Paul in Galatians talks about going and submitting the gospel that he preaches to Peter, James, and John, who seem to be pillars in Jerusalem. Now there they, there they extend their hand of fellowship, affirming that you know, Paul is indeed an apostle, but it's that practice of the three, which is again the law of Moses, let everything be established by two or three witnesses. Here they are making this priest a bishop. 
So I hope that answers the question about bishops, and then we'll jump into some more questions about priests and deacons. Thanks.